الحمد لله الذي جعل الإسلام للمسلمين نظاما وأنزل القرآن الكريم دستورا للناس وبيانا وجعله حكما وحكما وأحكاما سعادتهم في الانتصام بحبله والعمل بأوامره وترك نواهيه وشقاؤهم في إحمال عمله وما يحويه اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وارض اللهم عن صحابته وآله بأوامر الدين ونشروه ونشروه نقيا خالصا للعالمين. يا الله، we gather today to express gratitude upon your greatest gift to us. In conjunction with this event, we ask for your help and guidance. يا الله، kindly give us strength and courage to face the struggle to find and gain knowledge. Kindly bestow blessings and physical and spiritual health, fitness of mind, peace of mind, strength of spirit. Allahumma ya hayy ya qayyum, ya dal jalal wa ikram. Ya Allah, give strength to our teachers and our leaders to continue to serve for people, society, nation, and religion. Ya Allah, make our country as a country who got the blessing and favor, everlasting peace and prosperity of all time. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana tamwatina ala al-nar. Wa adkhilna jannata ma'a al-abrar ya ahi ya akhar ya rabba al-alamin. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi wa rabbil alamin. Amin, amin ya Allah alamin. Thank you to Mr. Ashraf Ishaqui. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Ashraf Ishaqui, the director of Unity Talk, Reaching to Islam, to give his welcoming remarks. Delegates from Interactive Dakwah and Tarbiyah, led by Bro Brother Lim Joy Sun, eh, Quran leaders, committee members, our partners, PMI, Pembina, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum and a very good evening to all. We are delighted to welcome our 180 participants tonight. I hope that everyone is comfortably seated and ready to engage in this meaningful dialogue. Uh, are you in the um, comfortable? Are you comfortable right now? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, I hope uh, your presence here is a testament to your commitment to building a harmonious campus community. So let me start with the uh, objective first. The main objective of this program is none other than to foster a sense of togetherness. I, I, I repeat, a sense of for, a sense of togetherness among students with Islam as a solution. We aim to create a space where unity and understanding can flourish, guided by the principles of our faith, Islam. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to our sponsors, the Malaysian Ulama Association, Sarta Ulama uh, Malaysia, the Interactive Dakwah and Tabiat Association uh, for bringing Mr. Hijab, uh, Mr. Hijab here, and Quran League. A special appreciation also goes to um, <coughs> National uh, Islamic Youth Student Association, Pembina, and also our um, PMI, Apsatwa Mahasiswa Islam. Lastly, uh, I apologize for any shortcoming throughout this program. Uh, whether they have already occurred or may happen, I hope that everyone gains valuable insights from tonight's session. I hope, inshallah. Most importantly, 
let's let this insight take root in your heart, helping us create as a more harmonious and tolerant campus. Thank you, and may Allah bless our effort. Inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Moving on, I would like to welcome Mr. Lukman bin Hakim, President of Persatuan Mahasiswa Islam University Malaya, to present his welcoming speech. Our distinguished speaker, Brother Muhammad Hijab, delegates uh, from Interactive Dawah and Tarbiyah Association and also Kurani. And also the committee, committee members, ladies and gentlemen who present tonight. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalam. Inshallah tonight. I stand before all of you, only I want to speak about the importance of unity uh, from the perspective of Islam. And also I want to share my hopes uh, for this program, which is we want to foster a, a deeper understanding of Islam principle of unity. In Islam, unity is not only a virtue, it is a fundamental pillar that holds the community together. The Quran emphasized this in Surah al hujurat verse 10, which means, the believers are but brothers, so make settlement between your brothers, and fear Allah that you may receive mercy. This verse underscores the importance of brotherhood and resolving the differences uh, amicably. And also, unity in Islam transcends race, ethnicity, social status, and also advocating for a community where mutual respect and cooperation thrive. And before I finish uh, my speech, uh, this program, uh, for your information, is a collaboration effort between PMIUM, Pembina UM, and also the Interactive Dawah and Tarbiyah Association. Together, we aim to rekindle the foundational purpose of PMIUM, which is serving as a platform for the understanding of Islam among University of Malaya students. Additionally, the Unity Talk program also provides an opportunity for us, PMIUM, to engage with the international students. And also, I am very pleased to highlight that PMIUM has been a steadfast platform for Muslim students since the establish establishment in 1956 by Dr. Said Nakib Malatas. And I hope that this unity talk receive a positive response from other student movements, serving as a call to strengthen our unity and let us work together to make our beloved Baski a beacon of intellectual and community excellence admired for its knowledge and cohesion. I think that's all from me. Wallahu a'lam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Lubar bin Hakim. Ladies and gentlemen, we gather here today to discuss an important topic, unity talk reaching to Islam. In Malaysia, where diverse cultures, ethnicities, and religions coexist, the principle of unity and harmony are very essential. Islam, as a comprehensive and inclusive religion, provides us tools to build bridges of understanding and cooperation. Without further ado, I would like to invite our honourable guest, 
Mr. Muhammad Hijab to deliver his lecture on Unity Talk, Vision to Islam. Please welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? It's good to be here, mashallah. A beautiful university with exuberant and enthusiastic students. I've heard good things about the people here. And today's topic is an important one. It's one that we are in dire need of, one of unity. However, after I finish the topic, and I don't want to speak for too long, I want to open the floor for questions and answers. And I'm hoping that the majority of today's session will be, in fact, an interactive one where we can speak together about the important topics. And you, you're free to answer, ask any question you like, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim. If you have a question about Islam, about Muslims or anything else, you're free to do so. In Islam, unity is of different grades. The idea of unity of different levels and grades. And that's not just in Islam. That's in human life. Human beings as social creatures find what you refer to as in-group, out-group dynamics. They create them for themselves. So for example, at the very simplistic level, you have a family. Okay? You have, let's say, for the sake of argument, a nuclear family. Now, of course, today, in the age that we live in, a nuclear family is seen as a normative thing, which is itself under attack. I mean, especially where I'm from, living in the West, the nuclear family, the man, the woman, and the kids, this model is seen as, in many ways, outdated. There are homosexual families, or there are transgender families, and so on. But that's another discussion for another day. Okay? Not getting into the complexity of that, at the very basic level you have a family. And if I were just to say, let's do a thought experiment. And let's imagine you're a father or a mother, if you're not already one. And there are two people drowning in a sea or in a river somewhere. One of them happens to be your own son or daughter. And the other person is someone else's son or daughter. And you only have time to rescue one. Okay. You only have time to rescue one. I think, and I'm not going to ask you this, but the majority of us would see an added obligation, you see, in rescuing our own children. Not to say that the other child is not worthy of being rescued, but we prioritize our family, and it comes naturally, biologically, over and above, let's say, non-members of our family. And in fact, that is an Islamic precept as well. Because when, in the Quran, from the Islamic perspective, the things, the order of things is mentioned. The aqrabun, or those who are closest to you, is usually mentioned first. So it's natural, it's instinctive, but it's also Islamic as well. For you to prioritize your own family members above and beyond non-family members. That's basically the reality. But then you say, okay, what about what comes next? Human beings throughout the ages have prioritized tribe, tribesmen and women, for example, because they're close in proximity. And in many ways, they can be an extended family sometimes to that person's family. And then you have the nation. Before we started, they done the national anthem because there's a sense of national pride. Now, obviously, that can be problematic at times when nations become fascistic. You know, what we've seen in World War I and World War II what nationalism can do. But to have a sense of patriotism for one's country or for one's province is not seen as a negative thing. And that's a natural thing because it goes by order of proximity. Then for us as Muslims, we prioritize what is referred to as al-Ummah, al-Islamiyah. The Ummah al-Islamiyah actually is prioritized above and beyond any national identity. The way it should work is the Ummah Islamiyah or the Islamic Ummah is the most important unit, and within that unit, you have the family. So the Islamic identity from the Islamic perspective 
is the most important identity. And the reason for that is because Islam tells you what the purpose of life is. Nothing else can tell you what the purpose of life is. Religion offers answers to what are referred to as the ultimate questions of life. The ultimate questions. Karl Popper, a philosopher of science, he dubbed this term the ultimate questions. Ultimate questions are questions about existence. Where did we come from? What are we doing here? What is our purpose? Islam gives you the answer to those questions. And as such, Islam is to be prioritized. That's why the Quran states, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبِ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold together to the rope of Allah and do not divide. Which means to say that the rope of Allah, it is the Quran, it is the Sunnah, it is Islam itself. Because it is the ro it's only the rope of Allah that can save you in the hereafter. So the basic diagnostic is that Islam offers a solution for humankind. And that is to unite upon ultimate purpose, not arbitrary measures. It's kind of comical to realize that human beings throughout the ages have killed each other on the basis of artificial borders. Can you imagine? They constructed, as a social construct, these images of themselves as superior because they are further away from somebody else. You saw, and I've mentioned this before, what happened in World War I and World War II. They were effectively a series of nationalistic wars. And so there's no objective reason why you should kill somebody else because they're so different from you. But there is an objective reason why you should unite with someone else because they're so similar to you. And the most important unit of similarity is similarity on purpose. So from the Islamic perspective, the question is, how do you do that when you have so many Muslims? You've got two billion Muslims on the earth. Okay? And the, the number is growing. In fact, according to Pew Research, Muslims will account for one of every three human beings on the earth by the end of the century. A third of the world's population will be Muslim by the end of the century, according to Pew Research, which is the gold standard statistical agency in the world which offers statistics. So how do you do that? The way you do that is, you realize that there is a difference between unity and uniformity. Unity is to come together upon a cause or a motive or a mission despite differences you may have with people. Uniformity is where you try to get everyone to believe in the same thing. And you cannot get everyone to believe in the same thing, whether it be in Islam or outside of Islam. If you try and force that, it actually backfires in a very significant manner. One thing I must give the West credit for, okay, I'm a critic of the West, I criticize the West in many ways, but I have to give them credit. Because in their formulation of civil society, they have been able to formulate societies, okay, which for the most part can tolerate difference but still function. We must give them some level of credit for that. They can tolerate difference but still function. We the Muslims have been able to achieve that historically, yes. But because there is not a unifying government like they used to be with a caliphate or something like that. We have not been able to do so with the same levels of success in the last hundred, hundred years, in particular, since 1924, <coughs> with the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. So how do you do that? The, reason, the, the rawness of that is you must put aside differences when you're engaging in community projects. Do not make as a prerequisite of someone joining your project or your institute or whatever it may be, that they must be the same as you in every single way. This is how to foster the healthy kind of tolerance, which will in fact help us as Muslims 
gain the strength that we once had. One of the English historians, Arnold Toynbee, referred to Islam as a sleeping giant. The civilization of Islam, not the religion of Islam. The civilization of Islam as a sleeping giant. And it's a very interesting imagery. The reason why it's interesting is because a giant can do lots of damage, <laughs> has lots of consequential power, is... I know that because I'm a giant myself. I'm a <laughs> But, no, a giant is Islam. If it wakes up, I mean, everyone is in trouble in many ways. But it's very interesting. I was, I was listening to, and I mentioned this in yesterday's talk as well, Samuel P. Huntington. He was having a conversation. He wrote this book called The Clash of Civilizations. It was an article, and it then became a book. He actually said, if Islam was united, he said this, and he's a critic of Islam. He's a critic of Islamic civilization. In fact, he advised America on how to disempower Islam and Muslims. He said you have to divide and conquer them, etc. But he said that if you did have an Islamic unity, that would make the world a safer place. The reason why is because the balance of power will be spread more evenly. When the balance of power is spread less evenly, that's when you find oppression. Let me, give, let me show you an example. Look at what is happening now in Palestine. Okay. The reason why that is allowed to happen is because of the hegemonic status of the United States of America. If there was... I mean, there are countries that can stand up to the United States. Russia, China, fine. But it's, they wouldn't do it for this cause. If there were Islamic countries that could stand up strongly enough, to the United States, which is the hegemonic power, okay, and they were of a similar size and strength, then we wouldn't see what we're seeing now. A bully can only do what a bully wants to do because the bully has the opportunity to do it. On a side note, and an interesting side note, not to ruffle any feathers here, but I was looking at domestic violence in different family households. And there's interesting statistics about lesbian households. Lesbian is like when two women are together, you know, in a relationship. I'm acting as if you guys don't already know. <laughs> and apparently the domestic violence in that relationship is very high. More so, apparently, according to some stats, than a normal male-female relationship. And the reason a lot of sociologists say that's the case, they say it's because the power is similar. When the, when the power is similar, sometimes it can cause more fighting. But if you have a great power that can stop something, then you can stop the oppression. That's why, the, you know, sometimes you have two brothers. Maybe if you were a brother one time, you used to fight your brother all the time, but then the father comes in and says, stop. You see. Because, like I said, for example, my marriage. <laughs> my wife's tried everything, but physical is not one of those things she's tried. <laughs> But well, she can hurt me in other ways. She has techniques. Point being, in order to defend ourselves as Muslim people against things that we're seeing like Palestine, like Rohingya, like the, the Uyghur, like this, like all these things that we're seeing around the world, the best way to do so is to actually gain strength through unity. That's the best way of doing it. We can't depend upon America to do it for us the mercy of America. United States of America doesn't act morally strategically. It doesn't act morally consistently. It only acts strategically consistently. So unity is a prerequisite for safety, actually. It's a matter of survival now that we become unified and we put differences aside. And for us to do that, we have to struggle with some of the spiritual things that we have, issues. Chief most among which are jealousy and resentment. These two emotions. And you might think, what's that got to do with anything? Jealousy 
causes somebody to act a certain way against somebody who may be close to them because they want to see the elimination of their blessings. Okay. And many people in the same categories will act jealous with each other. So you'll find jealousy happens, for example, between brother and brother, you see, or sister and sister. Sometimes it can be because there's one subject of attention. So the issue between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. There's not, it's not just out of nothing that sometimes there's a bad relationship between the daughter-in-law. That sometimes it's a good relationship, but it's because of jealousy. A lot of it is because of jealousy. A lot of the crimes that happen are between people of the same race. You wonder, why is it? It's because when jealousy becomes overbearing and they're in the same category, they're doing the same things, people kill each other because of it. And we have stories in the Quran. For example, the sons of Adam, which indicate what jealousy can do. So one of the things that we must do as Muslims, if we want true unity, it's not just, okay, strategically, we have to cooperate with people who have different opinions. Yes. But we have to work spiritually as well and psychologically to remove the jealousy that we may have from people who are on the same mission as us. That takes psychological work, self-accountability, self-reflection. Resentment is when you start disliking someone because you feel that they've hurt you. Okay? You start to resent them. In Arabic, this is called hiqd. It's called hiqd. And the Quran says, رَبَّنَا لَا تَجَعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Oh Allah, do not put in our hearts resentment for those who believe. Resentment is not a good trait. It destroys relationships when you dislike somebody. You start acting passive aggressively towards them or even aggressively towards them. You start disliking them. And that is an obstacle to community relations and relationship building. You cannot achieve unity when you have those emotions inside of you. So you have to ask yourself an honest question. I have to ask myself this question. And you have to ask yourself this question. Do you really, do you, are you jealous of somebody? I mean, if someone, I'm not jealous of anyone. At some point in our lives, maybe we felt jealous about someone. Maybe it's your brother, maybe it's your friend, maybe it's this, maybe that. Now, what do you do about this? There are ways in which you can combat jealousy. You can remove jealousy. Number one is through gratitude. Jealousy is removed through gratitude. Because when you remember what you have, and by the way, in Western academia now, they have gratitude studies. And they show that when you do something called gratitude journaling and something like this, it increases your mood. It increases your dopamine. It does all kinds of good things for you. And that's why these self-help gurus, they actually promote gratitude journaling. So you sit down every day, and you say Alhamdulillah, which means praise and thanks belong to God. And maybe you think about one thing at a time that God has given you. That will elevate your state. If you do that regularly, it's harder for you to become jealous of someone else's blessings. Imam al-Ghazali mentioned in Lahya al-Din, one of his compendious works. In the book, he, he dedicates an entire book on jealousy and resentment. He says that, Essentially, when someone is jealous of someone else, they are jealous because they are not happy with the division of God. You see, God, we, are, we believe in God, we believe in Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we believe God is the provider of al-arzaq, provisions. It's like you've gone into someone's house, you're a guest, and the host is giving you a certain amount of provisions, food, drink. Allah, in our lives, is giving us a certain amount of provisions. Food, drink, marriages, this, that, whatever. And notice how I put an S at the end of that word. <laughs> These are all arzaq, <laughs> or provisions. <laughs> you see. You cannot be unhappy with the provision of God. Because if you say, I wish I had what this other guy had, effectively you're protesting against the division of God. That's what you're doing. You're saying, I'm not happy with God's, the way he divided things. 
God is, effectively, you will say, God is wrong for this. I deserve it more than him. So at the, at the heart of jealousy is actually ingratitude. And the only remedy of that is gratitude. So you have to sit down and enumerate the, the blessings of God. Allah says, and if you enumerate the blessings of God, you will not be able to count them. God has given you so many blessings. Everyone in the world has something to be grateful for. Even someone with just a heartbeat, that's something enough to be grateful for. Resentment happens when you dislike someone. And usually that takes place after you've been hurt by them. Someone hurt you, said something bad to you, hurt your fragile ego. Now you become so hateful towards them because you think you're the center of the earth. And your ego says, no, I hate this person. The way to overcome that is to become empathetic. Even Robert Greene, who's a, he's an author, has written books about how rulers and other people can gain power. He's written a book called 48 Laws of Power. And he, he wrote another book called Human Nature, The Art of Seduction. He's written these kinds of books. And he says that empathy can be used strategically. If you're incapable of being empathetic, it's actually unstrategic. Empathy is when you put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. If you want unity to happen between communities and peoples, you must be able to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. It's a disability for you not to be able to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. I'm not saying empathy should be used for morality. There's actually a book by Paul Bloom called Against Empathy. It's an interesting book. But he talks about why that is not a good strategy, and I refer you to that book for further information. But empathy as a psychological tactic, it demolishes resentment and hatred towards other people. So sit down and think, why is this person behaving to me like this? What is going through their mind? Try and sympathize or empathize with them, see where they're coming from. So these are what I would call the psycho-spiritual tactics to achieving unity. Because unity is not just, I'll say, strategies. It's psychological states. You need to train yourself to be magnanimous, forgiving. Even when you think you're right. You have to train yourself. Forgiveness is a very powerful and courageous thing to do. Forgiveness is emphasized very heavily in the Qur'an. Pardoning and forgiving. It's, it's emphasized. And not just in the Qur'an, actually in many different books. Because when people forgive each other and pardon one another, they're able to go to the next step and work together and get more benefit in life. For the most part, having resentment actually does not get you any benefit in this life. It's like a fire. It just eats itself. Resentment is like a fire. It eats itself. You, you gain no benefit from being like this. So if you teach yourself to be grateful, empathetic, and forgiving, then you can achieve unity. So there is... As we mentioned, a strategic element and there's a psycho-spiritual element as well. With that, I will conclude and open for questions and answers. And you're, you're welcome to ask any question you want on Islam. Zakhmacha. Okay, so we've got somebody here who wants to ask a question. Yeah, yeah. Salam. How are you? Good to see you. I don't specifically have a question, but specifically a question based on a small story and answer. Okay. I remember the speech you gave. Yes. For everyone to see, all right? So basically, uh, I believe uh, three days ago, uh, I was kind of standing on the highway, right? My, my, uh, my car turned about a few, my money was at home, and it was a very long, basic story. Yeah. But point is, 
uh, I came, I was thinking about it because it was raining like crazy that day. Yeah. I was just somewhere out of between Saruja and Burj that I stuck, right? Stranded. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would go on training to ask him for that breath and right, left and right, yeah. for one hour before, from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Just stand beside the highway. No one even stopped, right? Yeah. So at some point, I just gave up and slept in the car. I mm. mean, I was thinking about what should I do at that final at 10 a.m. Yeah. What am I supposed to do? I just slept. Right, I said, it's just so it's up. I slept, woke up at 9 a.m. still in the same exact place. Yeah. So, yeah. It was crazy on the wow. highway. Uh, upon waking up, you know, I, was, I just got anxious because I need to make it time for this time for my final. So I mm. just did she act it up and was able to manage myself all the way uh, to get to get to get, get the sensation, right? Yeah. So upon my way back, I was thinking of like uh, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Especially, you know, this thing, this is actually a specific <coughs> event, man. Uh, so woke me up kind of to more to the judgment, actually. Okay. So that, it might sound weird, but. Yeah. It, because uh, that day yeah. I was like, if I'm not, if I'm not as a person supposed to be, uh, if, I'm, if I'm a person, I won't believe in the day of For example, I can do everything, I can do every single thing possibly, like ha harming people, not helping anyone, mm. thinking, whatever it is, whatever it is that it's regarding trusting others, yeah. I can do it. And the only thing stopping me from actually being judged in this life, if that's at court somewhere, is that, right? I can just think myself and done, mm. right? So upon this, I started thinking of it, and it kind of really wake up this specific exact event, you know. And the first verse mm -hmm. that kept on ringing in my head was a small verse, actually. Yeah. Uh, in Surah Duha, you know, فَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَمْ Yeah. And the beggar doesn't fall. And here, I'm not talking about the beggar who asks for money, actually. I'm thinking of the beggar of anyone who asks for help. Mm. I'm thinking, of, it's like, I'm not sure if it's the exact meaning, but I'd love to think of it this way. It helps me think furthermore. Yeah. So I thought of it, and it kept actually bringing on my way back from and all the examples. Why am I sad that I don't know? Because if, for example, I won't, for example, help out nobody, right, for example, yeah. then what's the point of me, as you said, providing unity yes. for everyone else? Because if we don't help out each other, then we're not united. And if we're not united, then what's the point of the city, for example, right? Yeah. Upon this, I started even thinking of it more. And it made me also wake up like that. It made more sense to me that us as humans, waking up, waking up after death and being judged makes more sense to me that we won't even wake up in the first place and just remain there. Mm. Because mm. if we can get away with everything, not helping, not doing anything, not eat, not doing anything specifically for God or for others' help or like oppressing, killing, any type of negative, negative impact to society in general, really is senseless and basis at that time. It mm -hmm. doesn't make sense to me anymore. Waking, make, waking up after that makes more sense than that. Yeah, because imagine, I can do everything. I'm dead, all right, that's it, you know. I, I won't get to stand in front of court in this life, for example. I can kill everything. Mm -hmm. right, I'm done, you know, I just can die. Yeah. So it, it makes sense. If, um, no, you make, a, you make a good point. No, I thank you for the contribution. Yeah. I think uh, it's an interesting thing you said. Yeah, thank you. So this, I just want to share this. No, no, it's, it's, thank you for sharing it. No, it's yeah. a good point, yeah. good point. Let's get someone else. Yes, yeah, good. Thank you, brother. Um, yeah, anybody else? Yes. Salam. Jazak. Yes. Salam. Yeah. As well as the unity within our personal lives, when yeah. we are jealousy of uh, our friends or our know, community members. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, what is the borderline of people you can unite with? Uh, like for example, what is the like limitation that you can? Once this thing happens, you say to yourself, okay, that's it. I cannot be. I cannot maintain this unity with that other. Uh, part of the Ummah, I'm talking like externally as an Ummah, you know, we have a lot of labels now, and a lot of separations, I'm sure you're aware of it, like, yeah. uh, whatever we can mention groups like uh, 
Yeah, it's very clear. And the answer to your question depends on the context. Because unity is an abstract term, you see. And it can only be really understood when it's contextualized. So unity is not just something which happens abstracto. For instance, like if, if you had a daughter who's going to get married, okay, and she says, okay, well, let's say she's a Sunni, right? She says, I want to get married to a Shiite. Maybe the family will say this kind of unity is unacceptable, actually, because there's too much of a dif difference here in this context. Or vice versa, you know, a Shiite and a Sunnite. They say you don't want to marry each other because it's going to create confusion for the child. I fully understand that, and that's correct. But let's say, for example, you have a situation in Palestine, and we can both help each other here and defend certain things here or raise money here. That's a kind of unity. I mean, the Quran says, وَتَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ وَلَا تَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعَدْوَانِ Do not or come together on al-birr and al-taqwa. Thank you, thank you. And do not come together on evil deeds. And that's a general verse. It's called am. Ayatun am. It's a general verse. It includes everybody. In fact, in many ways, we could unify with non-Muslim people on certain good causes. If someone says today, you know, let's do a charity for Gaza. We're not going to say, okay, only Muslims can contribute. If non-Muslims want to contribute, they can contribute. So the, the, the point I'm making to you is it really does depend on the context. And each context requires a discussion. And it requires us to look at what's in the, the benefit of the majority of people. In fact, Al-Ghazali mentions this. He, he wrote a book called Al-Mustasfa. Yeah, it's, a, it's a book of Usul al-Fiqh. In fact, one of the most important books of Usul al-Fiqh ever written. And he has a chapter on something called Al-Maslaha Al-Mursala. Okay. In that chapter, he gives you the conditions of acting in the, in the benefit of the majority of people, or maslaha of the people. He says, if three conditions are met, it's very interesting how in depth he, he goes into this, by the way. He says it has to be daruri, kulli, and it has to be uh, in the maslaha of the people. So, for example... If there's a situation, he actually gives these thought experiments. He says, if you have a boat and there's three people in the boat, is it acceptable to throw the third person off the boat if the other two people will survive? He says, no, in this, in this context, it's not allowed to do that. But he gives an example of what if you have an enemy army coming in and to defend yourself, you have to do such and such, this thing called a tatarros. Can you do it in order to save the majority? He says, in that context, it's allowed. So context is king when it comes to the discussion here. And as I mentioned, each context has a specific parameters. So there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to this question. And it depends on exactly what sect we're talking about within Islam or even outside of Islam. So all of that is dependent. Yeah, sorry? Yeah, so I gave the example of marriage. That's kind of like a personal thing, right? Like, for example, the business, okay? Business, you're unifying on a project. Can you have a sharik, someone who is a business partner, who's a non-Muslim? Yes, you can, for example. That's a kind of unity, right? Uh, what I'm saying is it really does depend on what we're talking about, personal or communal. Uh, so thank you for the intellectual skills, it's very insightful. Uh, thank you very much. I have two questions. The first one is, what is the philosophical difference between the Islamic understanding of gratitude and sugar and versus the more Western, uh, yeah. because when, when we study gratitude, we learn in English, yes. but I don't think we really understand what sugar means. Uh, my second question was, uh, Muslims in uh, the West, uh, they use the... Abyssinian Muslims uh, from the Syria as a kind of like a role model. Uh, which, which Muslim, sorry? 
Uh, Abyssinian from the Abyssinian. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. As kind of like a role model minority living in a in a, in a foreign you know, non-Muslim land. Mm. However, I feel like um, those non-Muslims, uh, the Sahabis, they came back eventually to the Muslim lands. So, do you think that Muslims living in the West should try to come back and support the local economies to kind of reduce the brain drain that we are having over here? If that makes sense. Yeah. So the first question was, you just remind me of the first question? Uh, the first question was the philosophical difference between the Islamic understanding of shukr and okay, yeah. practices. It's, um, I actually watched a video on his channel, it's called, I think it's called Kirk Sagard or something like that, it's a German channel. And it was, it's very interesting, they, they have these very expensive animations that they bring out. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen it, some of you are nodding, it's about gratitude. There's one, there was one specific episode, they've done all about gratitude, and in the description box, they put all of these studies, Western studies, of gratitude journaling and on the effects of gratitude journaling. And they, and they were basically making the case, and these are you know, secular atheists, but they were making the case that gratitude increases your mood, it makes you happier, it's the key to life. They were saying this. And as they were saying this, there was a key ingredient that was missing. It is kind of unusual, to say the least, to say that your gratitude without naming the subject of gratitude. Like, for example, if I went to, if one of my friends took me, or, you know, gave me a lift to the university, to this university, like one of my friends did give me a lift, you know, and at the end of it, I say, thank you. I'm saying it to my friend who gave me a lift to the university. But if I say thank you, and there's no object, or there's no one I'm actually directing that to, it's a weaker form of gratitude, to say the least. So you're not getting the raw product of gratitude. The, raw, the only raw product, of the pure product of gratitude can be achieved when you direct your gratitude to the object most worthy of that gratitude. Now, in our tradition as Muslims, we have a hadith that says, Men lam yashkur nas lam yashkur Allah. Whoever does not thank the people does not thank God. So there is a form of being grateful to people in your life. If someone is doing good to you, find them as a mother, father, you know, it's healthy for you to say, you know what, you've done so much good for me, I just want to say thank you for everything good that you've done for me. This is something Islamic and it's something good for you to do psychologically. But there's something even better than that, which is to thank the entity ultimately responsible for your life and your sustenance and your maintenance for the position that you're in. And we call that entity Allah or God who created you and fashioned you and sustained you and is maintaining you. There is no greater entity worthy of gratitude than the entity that is allowing and is responsible for every other aspect which you can be grateful for. That's why it's the purest and the most raw form of gratitude that you can achieve. And it's very interesting because there's only one study that I've come across that mentions Islamic or Muslim people in general, in the in the vis-a-vis -vis quality of life or satisfaction of life. And it is one study that was conducted, I think, in the University of Meinham or one of these German universities in 2019. And one of I remember one of the um, people of the study was her name was Laura Tobin. And I think the name of the study was Life Satisfaction Among Different Groups or something like this. And she actually concluded, or they concluded, because it was a conglomerate of scholars, that people with the highest quality of life, according to them, were Muslim people. Now you might say that's contradictory to what we understand of the happy index, or the human development index, or these economic indicators. But that's not actually correct, because the happy index and these other economic indicators are not psychological indicators of people's actual happiness. They mentioned this in their website. If you go on happyindex.com, they've changed it up. I don't know what it's called now. They just call it the happy index, but it's not a psychological measure. When you study the most depressed nations in the world, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, and Forbes magazine, 19 out of 20 of them are actually Western nations. So there is something wrong. There's something going wrong. In the West, their form of gratitude is incorrect. Despite, it's called the paradox of unhappiness. Despite economic achievement, 
despite having tall skyscrapers. Look at Japan as an ultimate example. They have a forest that they... Suicide forest. They're an excellent community in terms of cleanliness and order and technology. They're the global leaders. Just like some of the Scandinavian countries. They're putting everyone to shame when it comes to that stuff. But why is it that those most technological people and most advanced minds, that they are unhappy? <coughs> this is the question. Why are they killing themselves? Why are suicide rates pound for pound as a ratio so high in those countries? It's because they have lack of meaning in their lives. The brother was making a, an interesting monologue before, and I was listening to what you were saying, very interesting stuff. And he was saying, imagine if there was no afterlife and no day of judgment, etc., etc. And that's a very healthy th thought experiment. Imagine if you had three days left to live. Imagine if you are on the sick bed in a hospital somewhere and someone told you you're going to die in a week. What would give you more comfort? To know that you're going to switch off, that your children, that your friends, that your memories, they mean nothing. That you are essentially an aggregate of atoms, carbon, you're a carbon machine, you're like a snowman, that you can be hacked away and it will just be a rearrangement of atoms. If you are on the bed and you thought, that's it, I'm going to die, I'm going to be rearranged and go back onto the earth. Or if you think that actually there's something more to it than this, there's afterlife. I'm not saying therefore God exists, and this is an argument for God's existence. I'm not making an argument for God's existence. I'm simply saying this level of nihilism or this level of bleakness, lack of meaning, it causes nothing but depression at the highest level. No matter how much money you think you can make. So when you have gratitude that is undirected to an ultimate source of gratitude, it becomes shallow gratitude, weak gratitude. It will still have an effect, but it will not have that potent effect that it would otherwise have if you were to spiritualize it in the theological manner aforementioned. Let's see, some of the sisters have any questions as well. Let's try and be as inclusive as possible. Okay, we've got a brother here. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I have two questions. The first one is, since a lot of us here are young, how would you recommend, are uh, there any resources or path would you recommend us to take if you want to go have a deeper understanding about Islamic philosophy or theology? That's my first question. And second is, on an organization level, I'm from a very small country called Mauritius, yes. and uh, a lot of times, Islamic organizations try to come together to help with some societal issues like drugs or whatever, but shortly after, all those debates about Aqida and whatnot will come and fall apart. So how do you set those guidelines beforehand so that those issues doesn't come uh, afterwards when you know, the time is more critical? Thank you very much. Yeah, so you would set the guidelines. You would set the guidelines in different ways. You have to have a subject, like for example, if you're playing football, you know, I don't know, soccer, football. You call it football here, though, right? You f play football. I mean, no one's going to talk about aqidah on the pitch, for example. Playing darts or pool or something. So when you say set the guideline, context is king. Context changes everything. Context can make or break a situation. Context can make the difference between life and death. So all you have to do is be a master at changing the context in the favor of whatever it is objective you're trying to achieve. And so if you allow a forum where people, and sometimes, by the way, it's good to disagree. You have to give people a chance to disagree. If people want to have aqidah discussions and this one, that one, talk about sex, we'll say we'll have an aqidah debate class. Okay? But there's two or three criteria. One of them is you have to agree to disagree. Second thing is you have to shake each other's hand. Third thing is you have to do something else. You can decide whatever it is. You have to subscribe to Muhammad Hijab's YouTube channel. <laughs> you have to do something beneficial for the community, you know? <laughs> whatever it may be. But what I'm saying is, setting the context is, is a skill. And it's like parenting. You have kids that want to fight each other. Make it into a formal competition. I have, by the way, I have three kids, yes? And the way I try to control them now is I made something called obedience game. This is a true story. And every time they do something which is obedience in my favor, they get five points. 
Okay, and they all compete with one another, and the champion gets a championship belt and becomes the obedience champ. <laughs> and honestly, they fight over this. And the, cry, the loser cries and this and that, and says, no, she won this time. And the, and the winner parades around the house like a, like a WWE superstar. So if, if pe people naturally want to be combative sometimes, you don't want to always restrain that. Just give it an outlet. Give it an outlet. If people want to fight each other, I mean, have you ever seen MMA or boxing? You'll notice that in the press conferences, everyone is swearing at each other, talking about each other's wife and this and that. All kinds of horrible things will be say, said. After the fight is complete, what do you see? They start hugging each other and raising each other's hand. Why? Because their ego has been removed. You've given them an outlet now to get rid of their resentment or anger, whatever it is, <laughs> and after they respect each other. So sometimes the way to remove unnecessary hatred for someone else is to create competitive environments. Sometimes it's to try and circumnavigate it some other way. So that's what I would do. And Allah knows best. Let's see if there's any sisters that have any questions, we'll prioritize you because you're not any women. Yeah. Hi, uh, good evening. Hi. Yeah. Um, so my question is not directly related to your lady, it's more of related to Islam in general. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. So because uh personally I'm a non Muslim. Yes. A question that I'm curious about. Yeah, so of I'm course. I'm just wondering how would you describe the relationship between, I guess, Muslims and Allah. Like, for example, is it is it just a creator and creation sort of relationship, or is there a personal relationship, or is it more like Allah is the boss and we are the employees? Like, how would you <laughs> introduce, I guess, Islam to a non-Muslim and like the dynamic between Allah and like other people? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. Thank you for asking it. So we believe that Allah is known through the attributes of God. Okay? Attributes are things that describe what God is about. So we have many attributes of God in the Quran, mentioned the Quran. Attributes like He's powerful, He's all knowledgeable, He's got ultimate will, He is a Rabb, which means He is the nourisher and the sustainer and the maintainer. He is Al Hayul Qayyum, which means He's ever living. He is maintaining everything. But also, we believe that God is forgiving. You see, He's al-afu, He's pardoning. And importantly, He's loving. You see, He is al-wadud. This is one of the things because people don't realize, I mean, they think it's a Christian-specific thing, that God is love. We actually believe God is love as well. So the relationship between the believers and Allah at the highest point of it is a love relationship. The highest form of relationship between you and the Creator is that you love the Creator. Some of the scholars of Islam actually described worship as qimmatul hub or the highest form of love. Because if you think about the human emotions, okay, I was considering this myself. What is the most powerful human emotion? This is a question. So first I thought it must be lust and sexual desire because it's a very powerful emotion. But if you're in a situation, and sorry to put you in this thought experiment, right? Where you are at the height of your sexual arousal, okay? Sorry to put you... <laughs> but someone came in with a gun to your head. What would happen? You would, you would remove all your sexual arousal in maybe one second, maybe two seconds. I don't want to go in details in this thought experiment. <laughs> but you imagine if like, you know, you're very aroused and someone comes and pulls out a gun. So then fear is more powerful than lust. And fear is more powerful than anger in many cases. Imagine someone, let me put you in another situation, less explicit, okay? You're walking in the street and someone barges you like this. Maybe you look at them and get a bit angry, right? 
You get angry, they pull out a gun. How do you feel now? <laughs> you feel fearful again. So fear can override anger. Fear can override sexual desire. Fear is a very, very, very powerful emotion. It's up there. So I thought maybe fear is the most powerful emotion. But I only thought of one other emotion that is more powerful than fear. And that is love. Because imagine now the guy has pulled out the gun. He's about to kill somebody. And, but you have a mother who loves her children, for example. Her love for her children will override the fear of the gun many of the times. So only love can overtake fear. Which shows you, frankly, that love is the most powerful human emotion. And frankly, the most pleasurable one as well. Someone was, if I were to ask you, as like, let's do a hedonistic exercise, okay? What's the most pleasure you ever felt in your life? Someone might say, it was when I was eating some food. And that's a very shallow pleasure. I mean, I don't have any great memories of, yeah, food eating is fantastic. I like the randang, I like this, I like that. Curry, uh, no problem. But it's not going to be like, okay, it can give you a good feeling, right? When you eat good food. A good steak and potato, this and that. Yes. Yes. It's a fantastic feeling. We have to do that after, after this talk. <laughs> get some steak, get some potato. It can feel viscerally fantastic. I'm not going to be inappropriate here, but sexual ecstasy is fantastic. Some say it's overrated. I say, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a fantastic experience. But higher and in this world, the most pleasure you can ever get is love. Trust me. There's nothing more pleasurable than you can get than love. Because you would live, die, and commit suicide on the basis of love. You wouldn't do that for food or drink or sex. You wouldn't. And I'm not saying anyone should commit suicide here, just in case someone's paying attention saying this guy's talking about suicide. But love is powerful. Romantic love, paternal love, maternal love, all that love. But above and beyond paternal love, maternal love, romantic love, that is station, let's call it A. But station A star, the highest level is the love you have for the Creator. Because that gives you stability. That gives you a kind of what you call tamatnina, tranquility. It's the best emotion you can feel. So to answer your question, the pinnacle of the relationship between creator and creation from the Muslim perspective is a love relationship between the creator and the creation. It's not a fair relationship, it's not an employee. Although all of that is there, we fear the punishment of God, yes. We, but love overtakes everything else. That's how I would answer the question. Let's see. Yes, sir. Salaam alaikum. Salaam First of all, welcome to my lecture. It's Thank you. Thank it's a you. pleasure to see you. Pleasure to be here. On behalf of my father, I would like to say you. My father really watches Islamic debates, and you are one of his favorites. Uh, this is not good enough. One of is not good enough. It has to be the favorite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pass on my regards, inshallah. Okay, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so coming on to my question. Yes. Uh, sorry, I will have to take you back to at the beginning. About the meeting. No, no, of course, fine. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, it's mentioned that, or you mentioned that if Islam was united, that makes the world a safer space, or a safer, sorry, a safer place. Yeah. So, to achieve this, do you think unity comes first, then uniformity, or it's vice versa? Unity, and then what was the other word? Uh, uniformity. No, so I'm, the uh, yeah. I don't think we should try and be uniform, you see. I don't think we should try, everyone should be the same. I think we need to find mechanisms of disagreement but that we still unify on political and social objectives. So what comes first is someone in certain areas, you can say in a country level, on a geographic level, on a state level, whatever it is, deciding, okay, we're going to collaborate with this other group for this purpose because it has this effect. When that decision is then made, then unity can be achieved. And then you can add on to that. But there has to be a culture of unity. 
There has to be a culture of, let's create unity within the community. So uniformity is not what we're aiming for. Uniformity is actually unachievable. Okay, it's unachievable. Unity is something the Quran commands. Okay, any other questions? Maybe we should go to uh, some more females, sisters, because we want to get everyone involved. If there's any female, we'll prioritize you, yeah? I don't think you're a female, brother, unless you want to <laughs> declare your pronouns. <laughs> okay, if there's no females, we can, go for a, we can go for a male. Yeah, go ahead. Salam. No problem. Uh, so, growing up in Malaysia, a few years back, we had like a situation uh, among Malaysians, uh, no, among Malaysians, yeah. Yeah. As you know, Malaysia is a multiracial country. Yeah. And multi-religion as well. Yes, it is. So, back then there's like a movement yeah. from Malays or Muslims here in Malaysia yeah. asking for us Muslims to buy only Muslim first. Okay. Buy Prioritize on the Muslim, but don't want to create any political uh, issue here. I just want yeah. to ask, as someone who lives in the West, yeah. what do you think about this? Because it's not just like give a bad image to us yeah. Muslims, it's also like create separation between us. Yeah, okay. Let me tell you what I think, okay? I live in the West. We have a right wing movement. It's an ultra right wing, we're far right. We call them far right. Now these are, for the most part, like usually white guys, men, usually it's men, but it can have women as well, who don't like the existence, who are not happy with the existence of ethnic and religious minorities in the West. And they are growing in number, okay? And I have unfortunately clashed with them many times, you see, these, these people, they, sometimes they ask for deportion, deportation, they'll say we want you to come out of the country, sometimes they'll ask for stopping immigration, sometimes they'll ask for this, that or the other. I asked around, and maybe I'm wrong, but maybe you guys are here, you can correct me, if there exists an equivalent movement here in Malaysia, where there is you know, a right-wing Malay movement that are telling all of the, you know, say, Chinese or the Indians or the other minorities to leave the country. And what I was told is that that doesn't actually exist. Am I right? It doesn't exist in the same way as the far-right movement exists, yes? In the West, you would agree with this. So isn't it interesting that those far-right figures in the Western world attack Islam on the basis of alleged intolerance when they themselves are being intolerant in a way that a Muslim-majority country like Malaysia, because it's still a Muslim-majority country, isn't doing. Because I think it's something to be proud of as Malaysians, to be honest, that you do have these other minorities in the, in the country, and that they're allowed to be proud to be, actually, Malaysian and Chinese or Malaysian and Indian at the same time. They can practice their religion, you see. That's something to be proud of. And that you don't have these extremist elements that exist in the West. And that is something unexpected, especially to the Western mind. Because they always say, I mean, this is something I've, I've, se I've seen and read a lot of the time. If it was a Muslim-majority country this wouldn't be allowed. If it was a Muslim-majority country, that wouldn't be allowed. Or, 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 but Malaysia is the ultimate example of the contrary of that. Because you have non-Muslim minorities who are living and, pros and prospering from the country. I've heard, for example, the Chinese community are doing very well economically, which is a great thing. <laughs> which is a great thing. No, honestly, it's a great thing. And, and they like to be in this country. No one's leaving. No one's leaving. It's a Muslim-majority country. And they're happy to be Malay and Chinese at the same time. Or Malay, I don't know how the politically correct terms to use here, so forgive me if I'm saying this wrong. And Indian at the same time, or whatever it may be. Like, you know, they have dual heritage, or they consider themselves Malaysian. But this is a good thing. It shows you that, it shows you that the image they have of Muslim-majority countries is a false image. To your question of Muslim first and all this kind of thing. Look, in Islam, it doesn't matter whether or not you buy or sell from a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew. I'm being honest with you, right? It doesn't really matter. I mean, you, I mean the Prophet ﷺ bought, the Prophet Muhammad bought from Jews. He sold from Jews. He bought from Christians. He sold from There's no issue with it whatsoever. 
If someone, for, for whatever reason, decides that they want to support their Muslim brother first or whatever, I'm not saying they're wrong for doing this. But they cannot say that other Muslims who decide to do business with non-Muslims are wrong either because it's not wrong. Do you see the point? So if they want to do that, they can do that. It's their prerogative. That's no problem. You can give, if you want to give your money to only Muslim businesses, this is fine. You can do this. But you cannot say to other Muslims who are giving their money to Chinese guy or to Indian guy who's not a Muslim or whatever it may be, that he's wrong. Because that's fine. He's, it's his business to do that or not to do that. And there's nothing haram about that in the religion of Islam. So that's how I would answer the question. If that, if that makes sense. Yes. Anything from the sisters? <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's up to you. I mean, I'm just trying to be as inclusive as possible. Assalamu alaikum, Rabbi Ijaz. Salam. Yeah, I just uh, would like to say thank you very much for your work. And, thank you. Uh, Sapiens Institute. And uh, thank you for coming to Malaysia. No, it's fine. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so the next time you come to Malaysia, perhaps you can invite your friends at Ali Dawa or Abdullah Al Andalusi. <laughs> you will welcome them with open arms. Okay, no problem. Uh, so, and Hamza, yes. Hamza, Hamza has been here. I've been to his talks. Yes, he's always here, Hamza. Yeah, he's always here. Yes. So my question is... Uh, he needs to get a Malay citizenship as well. <laughs> we might need it. If the right wing have their way, we might have to come here and, <laughs> and stay in Malaysia. <laughs> Just like Zakir Naik did it. <laughs> we, might, we might need to seek asylum here in, uh, in Malaysia. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> All right, brother Earlier you mentioned a lot about having empathy and uh, abolishing this feeling of resentment yes. towards others. Yes. So this begs the question, mm. how do we have empathy towards the, towards the Zionists, towards the IDF. Yes. Yeah, that's just my question. You can have empathy towards the devil himself. <laughs> no, it, empathy, it doesn't mean you agree with the person. It just means you're putting yourself in their shoes. Now, you can put yourself in their shoes and still disagree with them, by the way. Do you see what I mean? Like, when I have arguments with my wife, <laughs> I'm only, going to, I'm only going to do this all the time, but empathy doesn't mean agreement, okay? You can be compassionate to an enemy, and the best way to be compassionate with an enemy like the IDF is to be brutal with them, because that's stopping them from oppression. Now, how do you be empathetic to someone like the IDF? Put yourself in the position of a psychopath. <laughs> no. Now... Psychopathy is an interesting psychological situation. It, according to psychologists, 1% of the population is a psychopath. But it's interesting that you can train yourself to be a psychopath. There are studies that show that you can train yourself to be a psychopath. Now, it's very interesting. There's actually a guy who, who done a whole documentary with psychopaths, and his name was Piers Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> he has a whole documentary with psychopaths. I'm surprised he didn't interview himself. No, but it's interesting, because when he's having these interviews, I'm not sure if you've seen it, in, he goes to prisons, yes, and he's speaking to these psychopaths. Do you know when someone says, I don't care what people think? You know, they say, I don't, I don't care what people think. Everyone cares what we think. This is how we are. So, except for psychopaths. Uh, these psychopaths, if you look at their interviews with Piers Morgan, and especially the Israeli psychopaths on his other program, you'll see that they genuinely don't care what people think. So they'll do things like they'll start giggling. You'll tell them, oh, you killed this guy, you killed this child and the hedgehog and you killed this one. And they'll say, yes, I did. Yeah. They, they, don't, they actually don't care. Okay. Now, you can get to a level of psychopathy by, say, for example, if you see a child, usually this is like a telltale sign, and he starts harming an animal and laughing. You know? You think, you look at the child and say, okay, he's building up his psychopathy here. When he gets older, like, sorry to say, a lot of men in the West, the way they use women, yes, because women are objectified in the West, you see. We, we, there's a huge prostitution industry, there's this and that, you, you know. So they are objectified. They just use this sexual, a lot of women, not all women, but are objectified as sexual objects. And so the man doesn't think about this human being in front of him. A lot of men will just think of her as a sexual object, like a pornographic entity walking with legs. Like basically a, a big handkerchief. Doesn't think of anything else. 
And then he does it once, twice, three times, 10 times, 20 times, 50 times. And he downloads this app called Tinder. Hopefully no one knows what that one is here. <laughs> no, honestly. And then they keep swiping and this and that, meeting and then leaving, meeting, leaving, meeting. And then they become psychopathic now. They don't look at a woman as if she's a human being now. They look at her as if she's there to... And it can happen. So you have to put yourself in the shoes of someone like this. Why did they do that? Usually someone who does that has some kind of insecure, insecurity complex, inferiority complex. And they might do that because they think they're a victim. You see, when you think you're a victim, you think the whole world owes you, owes you everything. They might do that for theological reasons, and this might be controversial. But there are aspects, and I'm not saying all, so I'm being very careful here, of Jewish theology, which says this. That the whole world, the goyim are there to serve you. Like the whole world is there to serve you, and you are the master race. There are some, you know, rabbis who have in the Talmud and this kind of thing. You will see these kinds of quotations. So some of them have religious justification for it, you see. And they'll say, well, we are entitled to this. So you have to put yourself in the shoes of an entitled person, in, in the shoes of a psychopath. And then you realize, okay, this is a very dangerous person. How do you, what's the best way to deal with a psychopath? that's killing children, it's the same way to deal with a dangerous dog. It's to put them down. There's, honestly, there are some people you cannot actually reason with. The point of reason is gone. So the IDF, therefore, the best way to deal with them is to actually put them down, to kill them, to defend yourself against them. But of course, the problem is the Ummah doesn't have the power to stand up to the hegemonic power of the United States of America. Sometimes you do have to stand up to the enemy. But that's how I would answer. Because empathy does not mean always agreeing with the person you're empathizing with. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, uh, Unless there's a sister that wants to. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Oh, who's asking? I can't see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, Salam. So, first of all, thank you for coming here. Thanks for having me. Um, actually, I have. Oh, you've got a lot of questions. Too many questions. Just one will do, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to figure out which one should be prioritized. I think this is specific to my, my, basically my studies. Yes. So I'm, set, I'm doing PhD in philosophy. Yep. So how, how do you perceive, what is your take on the idea, uh, meaning your personal take, on the idea of libertarian free will, because some people, some people, libertarian free will, so, because it seems intuitive, although, although there, there were studies that say that uh, the intuitiveness of, uh, the, the claim of intuitiveness of the libertarian free will is, uh, is weak, right? Yeah. Ha however, some people uh, opt for the position because they feel that um, at least, uh, in practical sense, we, we, we have the sense of moral responsibility and then uh, it allows us to, to, to operate our ethical life, giving moral judgment here and there, basic desert. So, so things is, from a practical perspective, I'm asking you that, is it the case that if, if libertarian free will is true, therefore we can have a, a moral judgment is valid or we can have a moral yeah, so that's basically, okay. your, basically your personal uh, position. Yeah, so in, in philosophy there are three opinions on three major schools of thought on free will. Okay? One of them is called libertarian free will that you mentioned. The second one is called compatibilism. And the third one is called determinism. These are the three schools of thought in secular philosophy. Okay? Now, the two most dominant in the Western Academy is compatibilism and determinism, those two. The, the problem with libertarian free will is that it's not just making an argument that human beings have free will. Compatibilists also agree that human beings have free will. It's, it has to refute the idea of a cause and effect. Because for libertarian free will to hold true in an absolute sense, the cause-effect relationship would have to not be true. Because how does a determinist prove that things are happening deterministically? They say there's an uninterrupted causal chain. So for someone to be a truly libertarian free will advocate, they have to first refute the cause and effect chain. 
That's why a lot of them use quantum mechanics, for example, to do so. They say, well, this is the quantum fluctuation and this and that and whatever. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to refute something like the chain of cause and effect, and therefore not many philosophers adopt this view. In terms of moral reasoning, you can still have the idea of being a moral actor if you believe in a combination of libertarian, or not libertarian, but free will and a kind of determinism. And this is called the compatibilist position. But because this is very technical, what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer you to something I've written on the Sapiens Institute. It's called Free Will and Determinism, because there's a question that many people ask. If God has determined everything, then how do we have free will? So I answer that in an entire essay that you can see free of charge on the Sapiens Institute. But because it's very technical, I feel like if I were to speak more about it, the benefit would be uh, very uh, limited. You see what I mean? Because you're a PhD student, it's very difficult to, you know, it's, it's, it's a very technical topic. Yes. Um, yes, sister, go ahead. Hi. Hi. I thank you so much for the talk. It's so lovely to see you in person. Thank you very much. Well, yes. So, um, my question is, uh, since you say context is king, I'm curious, how do you create unity in your family? Since we come from a household with different minds and opinions, I believe in the importance of empathy, but aside from that, are there any, any other Islamic values that we can practice to contribute to unity? Yes, absolutely. It's a very good question. A, a good one is generosity. Yeah. Being generous means to give someone something without expecting a return, okay? So if you have, the first thing is if you have members of your family who are less well off than you are, if you're making more money than them, then you should bring them in and help them out and be generous towards them. But it's not just money you can be generous with, you can be generous with your time. You can be generous with your support. You can be generous with different things you can, you can do. So I think that if I were to add another thing to what I've mentioned already, Generosity is a very powerful, especially if you're continuously generous. If you're continuously generous to somebody, there's less likelihood that they will become disunified with you or other people. And if you're generous to multiple people, then they're more likely to be good with each other because you're being generous with them. So if I have two children, or three, I have three children, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be generous with each of them, but if they're not generous with one another, I withhold my, my money. You see, I say, look, you've been very bad, and then they start crying and this kind of thing. But that's the way to control behavior sometimes. You can be strategically generous. That's what the United States does. They're not generous, they just, uh, they use bribe, bribery. And there's a fine line <laughs> between bribery and generosity, so just be aware of that. But generosity is one of the other ways you can, you can do that. Any other questions? Uh, there's, a, there's a man at the back. Yes? But we, have, uh, we need to, uh, to wrap up. Yeah? For a session for Quran. Quran? Okay, we have one more question. We do it, yeah? Okay, we have the man at the back there with yeah, his hand up. Last question, and then he's going to do some Quran. Quran. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, my question is, how can we navigate through the theological differences among Muslims and also Muslims and non-Muslims uh, while maintaining the sense of unity? For example, I, mean, I know you uh, address maybe various uh, different angles of this issue, but for example, when it comes to Palestine, you know, uh, both Sunni and Shia are united in this matter, but uh, where do we put the limit? And um, the other question is uh, quite personal. Uh, you have spoken about uh, encountering some challenges on your faith journey. Uh, how can, if you can elaborate on how you overcome these challenges, and if you have any advice for uh, young Muslim who might be in doubt, or for non Muslims who are thinking of converting to Islam, but they still Thank you so much. Okay. So, on the first issue, there's two premises. It's a very interesting saying. One of them is, do not interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. Okay, that's one thing people say. Don't. Make, but it's also the case that do not. Do not interrupt your enemy when they're helping you out. They're doing something to help you out. Now, 
Iran, for example, is a tricky topic because people look at Iran and they have all kinds of things to say. And I have many things to say about Iran and you know, the government and the practices and all that kind of thing. But if they're taking a better stance than the majority of other neighboring nations, I'm not going to say, okay, listen, you are Shiite, please stop helping. <laughs> if it was a non-Muslim country, no one would even have a question about this. But because we have a taboo with the whole Sunni Shiite thing, there's a discussion about it. But I don't see it as even a questionable thing. Okay? If someone is helping, anything is allowed now in terms of help because these guys are being killed en masse. Of course, you could argue Iran is being performative and playing its own game and having its own geopolitical thing and, and all those things you can make the argument and I'm sympathetic to those arguments. However, for me, I don't care because uh, eventually or essentially, you know, I just want to see the, the suffering of the Palestinian people go down. You see? And if Iran's going to throw some drones and stuff that's going to make the Israelis scared, then the more the merrier. In fact, maybe they should strike them harder, really. So I haven't got an issue with this. Um, that's one thing. So in terms of accepting help, it, look, it's a very clear usul principle anyway. Uh, you know, you can't blame people that are being massacred and stuff like that from accepting help from people from different sects. I consider that to be actually quite ridiculous. It's actually childish. It's a childish thing to say. But at the same time, it doesn't mean we're going to agree with them on the, you know, on the issues where we disagree. We're going to disagree on certain issues. That's fine. So that's the first thing. In terms of the, own, the second thing that you said about the faith journey and, 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 and that thing, look, everybody looks for the truth. Or at least everyone should try and look for the truth. And I think the, the pursuit of truth is more important than the pursuit of happiness. In America, there's actually a film that they produce called The Pursuit of Happiness. It's ironic because I, happiness is one of those things, when you try and pursue it, you usually fail in pursuing it. Happiness is a byproduct of purpose. It's not something you try and seek in its own right. So the point I'm making is the essential question that you have to ask yourself is what is the purpose of life? Why am I here? And if you say, okay, it's to worship God, is to submit to the creator of all that exists. Then the next question is, how do you do so most effectively? That's where you have the differences of opinion and different religions and different sects. But I don't think religion is meant to be that complicated. It's not meant to be some kind of very complicated exam that if you get the answers wrong, that you're going to hell and you're going to be burning in hellfire forever. I genuinely think that if someone is sincere and they ask God in his oneness, to guide them, that they will be guided by God. That's what I believe. And Allah mentions that in the Quran. He says, Inna alayna lal huda. Upon us is guidance. Allah mentions in the Quran, فَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٍ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ That if my slave asks me about me, I am near. I answer the caller, call of the caller when he calls. So this is an open thing for all of humanity. Islam is not an exclusivist religion to a specific tribe or a specific race or a specific ethnicity. Islam is an international religion for all people from all walks of life. So long as you're a human being, you qualify to be a Muslim. You're invited to be a Muslim. You're welcomed to be a Muslim. You'll be equal to other Muslims. You will not be lesser than other Muslims. That's how it should be. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqanakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'annakum shu'uban wa qaba'an li ta'arafu. Inna akramakum a'inda Allahi atqaqum. O humankind, we have created you from, from two, from a man and a woman, and we've made you into tribes and nations, so that you may get to know one another. That the best of you are those who are most pious. And the Prophet told us, there is no virtue of a white man over a black man, or an Arab over a non-Arab, that the best of you are those who are best in piety. So to answer your question, if you're sincere and you ask Allah to help you and guide you, you'll be guided. And there is a dua that the Prophet Muhammad used to make, which is, Allahumma erin al-haqqan wa rzuqna attiba'a. That, oh Allah, show us the truth for what it is and give us or provide for us to follow that truth. And I think that's the best place to end this talk. Jazakum Allah khairan to everyone. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Thank you, Mr. Mama Hijab, for the respectful lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will take a short commercial break. Please enjoy the special advertisement from our sponsor, Kuanli. Ah, why don't we push each other to read the Quran? Quran is the only Quran app in the world that allows you to add friends and family. Every time they read, it notifies you. Every time you read Quran, it notifies them. It pushes the children to read the Quran. The Prophet told us to compete in good deeds. Download Quran, try three for seven days, and change your life with the words of Allah. Thank you, Qur'ani teams, for the amazing video. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give Brother Hijab to answer the questions from audience and conclude again our discussion. Brother Hijab, this stage is yours. Please welcome. I'm going again, yeah? <laughs> yeah. We're continuing the question and answer session. Continue. Yes, okay. Let's go. Okay. I've got more. I've got more in the tank. So long as we get the steak afterwards, that was always about. Right. Any females that have any questions? Any sisters? You might not get this golden opportunity again, sisters. Don't be shy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes, sir. Actually, I'd like your opinion on something because I heard a few mixed uh, responses when I asked this question. Yeah. Let's say it's a country, and we believe a country is oppressing the Muslim ethics of that country. Mm -hmm. Not the Muslims in general, just the ethics from that country. Is it morally incorrect to visit, or is it fine to visit, or is it advised to actually see the affairs of the Muslims in that country? What's your thoughts on this? My thoughts on that is it depends on what the reason for the visitation is. So, for example, there are things in Islam that you have to do as a matter of wujub. For example, Silat al-Rahim. Say, for example, you're from such a country, but your mum or dad live in the other country that is oppressing the Muslims. And you have to go and visit your mum or dad. So it could be the case that it could be a lesser of two evils for you to, to give money to the, you know, the, whoever it may be, the plane tickets or something, for you to visit that country in order for you to visit your mum or dad. It might be your paternal auntie or uncle. It could be your grandma or granddad. This all falls under the remit of Silat al-Rahim. And so I'm giving you an example of a certain situation. You could go to that country, for example, not to do something wajib, but to do something which is fardu kifaya. For instance, some people go to countries like this to help with charity. So you, your presence in the country will have a net benefit. So it depends on the situation. You know, it's like anything else. Context is king. It, there's not a one-size-fits-all policy. But then almost every country in the world, and I say almost because we have some good countries, but almost every country in the world is doing some crime of some sort. What does it mean? Like, for example, I'm from the United Kingdom. When I go and get a sandwich from the shop, some of my money is being used to, f to fund some nuclear weapon, for example. Should I stop eating sandwiches in the shop? You know, so you have to think, kind of look at things like this as well. Like, what are you running away from and what are you running away to? Because the whole boycott thing, we can boycott certain brands. Some people have like a list of 300 brands for the Israeli boycott. That, sometimes that can be too much for someone to even remember, let alone to follow. It can be sometimes better to have five or ten brands that you boycott. Could be, for the sake of argument. And so we have to be strategic about this, but we also have to be realistic about this. So these are my thoughts. Yeah. So, Assalamu alaikum, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Akhmad Abdul Rashid from Uzbekistan, and I will try to make my question shorter and clear. So, I study international politics, and uh, I will ask a question about this uh, field. There have always been political economic uh, ideologies 
that have affected the world's socio-economics or shaped the societies, uh, for example, Marxism, communism, socialism, or in today's uh, 21st century uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. So, in uh, your opinion, which socio-economic ideology uh, does Islam support most? Or in, a, in other words, which one is the most beneficial for uh, Muslim societies? Or is there any uh, socio-economic ideology uh, that is not Thank you so much. So, the way you've got to look at political ideology is that for the most part, they have their own premises and that they are secular premises for the most part. Islam has its own system. And the premise of it is La ilaha illallah. It's a theological premise that God is the, uh, the ultimate lawgiver, that He is the only one responsible for divine commands. In the West, like you mentioned, you've got a capitalist system which is based on free market economics, but you've got also a liberal social order. So if we take that and unpack it, okay, free market economics, okay, we don't have too much of an issue with it from the Islamic perspective. And the evidence of that is that one time someone came to the Prophet Muhammad and asked him, they said, these people are raising the price so high, so can you fix the price? He responded in hadith, he said that Allah is al-musa'ir, he is the one who sets the price. It's very interesting because the West then discovered what they call the invisible hand of the market economy. I'm not sure if you've heard of this phrase. Ricardo and Adam Smith, who wrote famously about the invisible hand of the market economy. So we believe in Allah. He is the one who sets the price. Meaning, leave the market to do its thing. Okay, we have obviously redistribution models. We have zakat, we have sadaqah. But controversially, you'll be surprised, taxation is not really an Islamic precept in a, in a general sense. I'm not saying that therefore there should be no taxes. I'm just saying it's not something that comes from, emanates from Islam. So it's actually quite a rigorous free market model, if you think about it, with a redistribution clause attached to it. And in fact, not just in sadaqah and zakat, but in fay and ghanima as well, this idea of before when they used to conquer lands, they used to take this kind of spoils of war. And there's an interesting verse in Surah Al-Hashr which says, So that it does not become, so money does not circulate among the elites amongst you. It's an interesting precept that money shouldn't just circulate between the elites. There should be some level of parity. And now in economics they have something called the Gini coefficient, which is, they look at the poorest and the, 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 the richest in one society and they look at the difference between them. So there shouldn't be a great disparity between the two. So free market economics is acceptable with all of those caveats and clauses. Liberalism and or capitalism is not really acceptable because it's based on riba. It's based on this idea of interest. And Islam is vehemently against this idea of riba or of interest market economies. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad predicted in the future that the whole economy will be based on interest. And he said, Men lam yakulhu min Whoever does not consume it will be affected by its dust. But the Quran says, There's many verses that say that those who consume riba will not be resurrected except for someone who's been touched by the devil and so on. You know, then will be harbin min Allahi wa rasuli. That if you go into riba, that the, the, you've declared war with Allah and the Messenger. So it's a major sin in Islam, actually, the consumption of riba and interest. And so capitalist economies, which are interest-based, is something Islam does not endorse. In fact, it's vehemently against. Thirdly, social liberalism is one of the issues. Because you'll find, like, when people ask you about Islam, a lot of the misconceptions about Islam, or some of the questions and interrogations about Islam, have liberalistic presuppositions. So someone will say, for example, why does Islam have a death penalty? You know, in Islam, or why is it that the thief, a sariq or a sariqa to faqata'u aidiyahum as jaza'a bima kasaba na kalam in Allah? Why do you have to cut the hand of a thief? Why this? Why that? Why is it flogging? Why is this allowed? Interesting, there's a book called In Defense of Flogging. Uh, a Westerner wrote it, it's called In Defense of Flogging. And he was saying that why flogging is a good thing. But his, his name is Peter Moskos. But putting that to the side, a lot of these questions are based on the idea of liberalism. 
that you should be able to do whatever you want. Why is there apostasy in Islam? Why is there blasphemy in Islam? This and that. Why is these things there? And liberalism is, social liberalism is the idea that you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. That's something Islam doesn't say. Islam doesn't say you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. There are things you can't do. For example, homosexuality, yeah, LGBT, and stuff like that. Now, that is the birth child of liberalism. Because they say, look, the argument is, if you have two people that are homosexual and they're doing their thing, they're not harming anyone else, what, who are you to get involved in that? So we question the premise that it doesn't harm anybody else. But we also say that Islam is a religion which governs certain aspects of family life. So it's not a free-for-all. And now one of the holy cows of liberalism is freedom of expression and speech. They say, you know, you should have as much expression and speech as you want. But then again, they contradict this. Many, in many things, and you know what the, those things are, like plagiarism, copyright laws. You can't just take someone's material, public, intellectual property and use it. This is called infringement, copyright infringement. So laws, they protect it when it comes to the monetary, capitalistic interests of the people, for example. Plagiarism is not allowed. You know that, being university students. You can't say, well, I plagiarized this guy, but it's freedom of speech and expression. You can't say this. Although an absolute freedom of speech and expression should allow plagiarism, really, if you think about it. Other things, like child pornography, is not allowed. But they will argue that is because it harms the child. But then you can argue, what well, well, if you create an AI image of the child? Now you have all these things, AI programs, you can make a fake child, why can't you make a pornography of a child that doesn't exist? That's illegal, in all, all Western countries it's illegal. But they will say because we have certain sentimentalities towards the idea of child pornography. We say, okay, well then you are infringing a kind of freedom of speech because you realize it shouldn't be applicable in all cases and all times. So who gets to set the bar of what is acceptable freedom of speech legalistically or socially? For them, the real, the real answer which they're too shy to say is the white man gets to set it. And I always use this example. For example, if I go into a bank in the United Kingdom, if I go into a school where there's children there, I've never gone into a bank in the United Kingdom or the United States or anywhere in the West, and I've practically covered the whole Western world, traveled to most of the countries there. I've never gone into a bank and seen a woman with a bikini inside. Now, it might be a strange thing to say, but social norm doesn't, dictate that you will find a woman with a bikini inside the bank. But if you go to the beach, you'll find many. Some of them don't even wear the bikini. So who gets to say this is acceptable and this is unacceptable? I can guarantee you, if there was a, a teacher in the United Kingdom, a woman teacher, a female teacher, who came into school with a bikini, she would be fired. She would be fired. In most schools, this is, they would consider it indecent. She cannot be a feminist and say, well, I can wear whatever I want. He said, you can wear whatever you want in your home. They will act like a traditional husband. The school prime minister, uh, prime minister, head teacher will say, go and do what you want at home. You cannot wear this in front of the kids. You cannot be in a nursery or a secondary school or primary school and wear a bikini in the United States or the United Kingdom. I don't know any school that that is the case. So freedom of expression and speech, whether it's legalistic, there are limitations. Those who say, we believe in freedom of speech. Okay, to what extent do you believe in it? That's the question. Because we've already given five or six examples where freedom of speech and expression is limited and everyone agrees it should be limited. Child pornography, child cartoon pornography, uh, infringement of uh, copyrights, uh, plagiarism. Even if someone, if I came up and, and, and demonstrated in the University of Malay how to make a bomb, some will say, no, you cannot teach this thing because then you're, you're, encouraging, you're encouraging a kind of criminal behavior. There are many things which can be considered freedom of speech and expression which we would say consequentially are harmful for society and it shouldn't be done. J.S. Mill himself, who is the father of social liberalism, he said that if you're walking in the street and you see people having sex, sorry to say this, 
He said this should not be allowed, it should be illegal for that to happen. He, he didn't say, he's the father of social liberalism, but even he has limits. So you should, people have, now they're doing this, by the way. There are some places in the, yani, where people do that in the West. There are some people that they, they can, yani, I live in a place in London where they have something called the carnival. I don't know if you've seen this. I came out of the mosque one time. <laughs> okay. And I saw a, a practically a naked woman. Yani, I was just doing salah. <laughs> I came out and she, she had like, sorry to say, stickers on just to cover the nipple. And I go, what's the point? What is this? And uh, down the road, they were doing stuff like openly in the streets. Openly. And videos, everything. This is London. Isn't it a blessing to be here in Malaysia then? <laughs> it's a blessing. Some of the brothers will say, actually, we need to go to visit London. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> so, <laughs> trust me, you don't, because in the carnival, they also have criminal behavior. They bring out the knife and this and that. So what, what I'm saying to you is that freedom of speech and expression, it contradicts what is considered to be consequentially wrongful or bad for the community. And when, they, when it happens at a, at a level where everyone can recognize it, they, they forbid it. So what we're saying is, who gets to, to choose the lines? We as Muslims have our own our understanding of human rights, our own understanding of freedom of speech, our own understanding of freedom of expression, and it's not based on those fake, arbitrary, subjective lines that are drawn by the white man and his tastes and, and, and his preferences. So we shouldn't try and embrace, you see, other people's ideologies. We should, have, we should be proud in our own religious and cultural identities. Okay, uh, that was a long answer there. <laughs> Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, well, God bless you and uh, God you and all of us. So uh, my question is, uh, what is the necessity of using philosophy in giving da'wah? And how do we know the borderline of using uh, philosophy in da'wah? Because as we know, in the early Islamic history, we can see the misguided uh, groups like uh, the Murtazila and Jahmiya and whatnot. So uh, how do we know the, you know, the necessity? What, what is the necessity and what is the borderline of uh, using philosophy in da'wah? I mean, you could, first of all, you have to define what philosophy is. I mean, a Cambridge Dictionary defines philosophy as the use of rational argument in order to come to a certain conclusion, for example. I mean, if philosophy, etymologically, the word comes from the, the word love of wisdom, philo, sophie, right, which means love of wisdom. So in a, in a broad sense, philosophy is just using your mind. It's just using rational argument. That's what philosophy is. That's really what philosophy is. In early Islam, those groups went astray because they used a specific kind of philosophy and they mixed it with Islamic aqidah. They mixed it. And what's happening today is we don't have Mu'tazilis around anymore, okay? But what we have is liberal Muslims, okay? Or feminist Muslim. They'll mix ideas of feminism and ideas of Islam together, like a, like a cocktail, like a poisonous cocktail and then drink it and everyone drink and get sick. Because what it was is that at the time, those particular Mu'tazilis were very impressed with Greek philosophy, because frankly, there's a lot to be impressed with, yes? So they incorporated it in. What's the limit of it? You should use it to come to the conclusion of Islam, not to try and change Islam. So when you mix it with the Aqidah of Islam, this is where it becomes unacceptable. If you're using standard rational argumentation to bring people to a common ground, this is fine. But when you start mixing it with the beliefs of Islam, this is where it becomes unacceptable. Yeah, the sister here wants to ask maybe a question. I'm sorry, maybe this is the last question. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. What would your advice be for women of our time in terms of priority? Um, you said women and what was the other thing you said? In terms of priori priority. So what what women should prioritize? Yeah. Oh, okay. In, in this time. In Islam. In this time. In this time, okay. Look, I mean, 
the thing both men and women have to prioritize is worshipping Allah. Okay? What is specific to women in Islam is the idea of motherhood. Okay? Now, not every woman can be a mother. Because Allah says in the Quran, يَهَبُ لِمَا يَشَاءَ إِنَاثًا وَيَهَبُ لِمَا يَشَاءَ الذُّكُورًا أَوْ يُزَوِّجُهُمْ ذُكْرَانًا أَوْ إِنَاثًا وَإِنَاثًا وَيَجْعَلُ مَا يَشَاءَ عَقِيمًا Not every woman can give birth. Allah gives some women male children, some women female children. He gives other women male and female children. And some women, he doesn't, she, they cannot have any children. So for those women who can become mothers, it's clear that Islam prioritizes the institution of motherhood. Modern day feminism has degraded this institution. In fact, if you look at some of the feminist works in the 1960s, for example, Betty Friedan, in her famous book, a feminine mystique, or Simone de Beauvoir, in her famous book, The Second Sex. All of them basically degrade the mother. You shouldn't be a mother, it's a, an oppressive institution, etc., etc. That's what Simone de Beauvoir mentioned, for example. And there has been a sentiment and attitude ever since that being a mother is actually an oppressive thing to be. It's a humiliating thing to be. It's a uh, an unequal and unfair thing to be. But what's interesting is that most studies have shown women who are in a high career, for example, like the famous study of Blanche Flower and Oswald from 1970 to 2000, which is the largest study ever conducted by 100,000 participants, both in the US and the UK, have shown that actually women, after the new rights and civil rights and all this kind of thing, and after they have gone into the workplace, have actually felt worse as a result of this. And they call this another study called the, the paradox of female unhappiness. There's other studies, like many studies, about this. There's no evidence that being a career woman gives you more satisfaction or more quality of life than being a mother. In fact, almost all the evidence is in the opposite direction. Now, that doesn't mean that women shouldn't work or they can't work. Or I'm not making any of those arguments. If a woman wants to work, she can work. I mean, no problem. But I'm saying if the priority becomes, I want to become a career woman, then the Western experience shown, has shown us that being a career woman doesn't actually bring about this satisfaction that you think it brings about. It doesn't. There's no evidence of that. There's zero evidence. In fact, many of the things show the opposite. The studies show the opposite. So I think Islam, by telling a woman that you should prioritize the institution of motherhood, prioritize your family, prioritize your worship, prioritize your health. Yes, you can work, no problem. If you need to work, if there's something, no problem. But if you prioritize this and it becomes, you, you get involved in the rat race and start competing and stuff. Well, if you get involved in the rat race, you have to remember you're still a rat. See? This is the truth of the matter. So, in that, sen in that sense, this is the second thing you should prioritize. Motherhood, family, etc., etc. And of course, da'wah is open for everybody, men and women. Propagating of Islam, bringing people to Islam, charity and everything else is the same. But this obviously is the thing that sticks out as a differentiator. That and obviously being a great wife, I mean, that sticks out as well. I hope, uh, I've said that enough to my own wife, but I don't think it's, it's worth it. But what I'm saying is being a great wife is very important because it is the, it's just like you're the midfielder in the pitch. You hold the center of the, the ring. It's a very important role. Having a family, being the mother, being the good wife, things and that, things can get done. Someone could argue, and this has been argued, well, if you're saying that, what will happen is, okay, you'll exclude half of the population from the economy and therefore, the, the country will go down in terms of money. Okay, this is the argument that's being made. The counter-argument to that is as follows. Studies have shown that when you have two parents outside of the household, that children are more likely to be delinquent, to have pathology, and to have a lower satisfaction in life. That actually costs money to the state to do that. When you have children who are depressed, others who are committing suicide, others who are becoming obese because they need comfort food and this and that, 
the state is then expended with all of that. And number two, even if we agree that you'll be losing some money in the short term in terms of, in terms of that, what's the point of having money as an economy if you're not going to use it in the things that you enjoy the most? And having a great family is the thing that you will enjoy the most, as we mentioned. Having, imagine being a mother, having children. Your children cannot grow up and say to you, you're fired. I mean, unfortunately, maybe in the West they do that. Uh, hopefully in Malaysia, they basically say that. I mean, they don't say you're fired, but say I don't want anything to do with you. But your employer can say that to you. You see, you can work with your employer for 20 years, show them all dedication. And one day you come into work and say, I'm sorry, we don't need you anymore. That can happen in economy, it can't happen in family. That's why one study that was done in a Harvard University, it's a longitudinal study, it, it said one of the things that makes people most happy in life is good relationships. So if you foster good relationships, as a man or a woman, but if you foster great relationships, loving relationships, relationship with your family, relationship with your Lord, that is the highest thing you can achieve in this world and it will grant you the most satisfaction of anything else you can do. Is that the last question? Oh, you've got a sister here, yes. Okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you for giving me the chance to ask the last question. Of course. And thank you for talking. So from your talking on uh, the tolerating others is a form of self-discipline. If you can tolerate others, you can offer resolve conflicts to a great extent. So for example, you help someone in distress, but when you are in need, they remain indifferent. You still choose to help them, but internally you despise them. So your actions are driven by your inner beliefs. Uh, from this perspective, I think uh, religion can help other, uh, oneself grow and also help others. So however, my question is, if you continuously practice uh, tolerance and consistently receive uh, lactic feedbacks, would you still consider tolerance is a good way to unite people? So specifically, uh, as a law Muslim, uh, I greatly appreciate the core teachings of Islam, especially uh, compassion. As you said, love is a powerful allergy, and its brilliance is most evident in situations involving life and death. However, in our everyday life, I believe tolerance is more about educating oneself. For those who lack empathy, it might become a neighborly environment. So I want to ask you, what do you think about this question? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, it was a very, very good points you made there, actually, and you're, you're absolutely right. I think at one point when you, were, when you were posing the question, you asked about at what point does tolerance become too much? Sometimes you can be very tolerant to somebody, but then they're not tolerant back. And tolerance, there's a, there's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he mentioned, unsur akhaka zaliman aw madhluma that aid your brother whether they are oppressed or they are the oppressor. And they said, how, and the companion said, how do you aid your brother if he is the oppressor? So the Prophet Muhammad said, you stop him from the oppression. So sometimes the best way to be tolerant against, with someone is to stop him from being oppressive. It's not all the time you're going to be tolerant. So if someone's a thief or is a murderer or something like that, justice is a prerequisite for tolerance and for compassion and for anything else. So sometimes you have to stop somebody if they're harming you. You can be nice to them. And if they're harming you, you must stop them from harming you. Because no one should harm you like that, you see. The way you have to do it is you have to respond in the energy that they give you. If they give you negative energy, negative energy, negative energy, then maybe you give them negative energy too. Because that way they can stop. But if they're someone like your mother or your father or your sister or your brother, then you have more tolerance. Because these are important relationships you want to preserve. If it is your spouse or your child or your auntie or your whatever. And also in Islam there's ideas of seniority. So for example, your father has more right upon you than your friend. And so if you respect the, those aspects, then 
you will be able to have a fruitful life. But of course, if someone's giving you a hard time, a stranger or something like that, Islam doesn't say, turn the other cheek. This is a Christian pre precept. In the, in the Bible, it says, if someone slaps you on one cheek, then give them the other one, let them slap you there as well. I have yet to meet a Christian, okay, who has told me, please give me, let me slap you. I mean, I would like, actually, I've never met one. I, I've never met one. One Christian in my life who said, okay, let, can, let me, can I slap? I want to slap. <laughs> they say, please slap. I've never seen. The Quran says, and this is an interesting verse. وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّئَةٍ سَيِّئَةٌ مِثْلُهَا وَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ That the recompense of a sin is a sin like it. Meaning if someone hits you, you can hit them in the same way as they hit you. If they hit you in one way, then you can hit them in the same way as they hit you. But it is better فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ The one who is forgiving or pardoning, then Allah will reward him. Allah will reward him, yes. If, they are, if you forgive, it's reward. Okay, you slap me. I'm not going to give you the other cheek. Why should I give you? That means I'm increasing you to be crazy. Then you're going to slap somebody else. You're going to be a bully. Be a narcissist. I'm encouraging narcissism by letting you slap the other one. You're making, normalizing bad behavior. I would not do this. And so what I mean is, the way to do it is, if someone hits you, hit them with exactly the amount but it's better to forgive them. And of course, if they're close family members, then you can be more tolerant towards them as well. I think with that, we will conclude. Thank you very much. Let him have Thank you, Badeo Papa Hijab, for answering questions from the audience. We truly appreciate your time and efforts in sharing your vast knowledge with us. Now, I would like to welcome Mr. Luqman Hakim, President of the IUM, and Mr. Ibrahim Yandam, President of Kumbina, to present a token of appreciation to Mr. Muhammad Hijab. Please. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very uh, nice. Now I can see, yeah? <laughs> okay. Thank you.